and welcome to The World Today on Channels Television. I'm Anne Mwawadu. Here's what's coming up today. No respite for residents in Europe as the days and nights get hotter. Plus, the actor strike in America picks up momentum as those in the United Kingdom intend to join. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Let's start with monitoring temperatures now across the world. As a heat wave across Europe, the Middle East and the United States continue. Meteorologists have said the residents in these areas called be looking at temperatures reaching 50 degrees Celsius by Wednesday. Here's more on the global temperatures. The temperatures are still rising around the world. In Russia, flat flooding has hit some parts of central Moscow on one of the warmest and humid days of the summer so far. Moscow airports reported dozens of flight delays or cancellations due to the weather, but the heavy downpour brought at least some relief for Moscovites after two consecutive days of very warm and humid weather, with temperatures reaching a maximum 28 degrees Celsius. Speaking of rising temperatures, Italians today brace for record temperatures that could see highs of more than 47 degrees Celsius on the Mediterranean island of Sardinia. Tourists have tried to keep cool by whatever means possible, splashing water on themselves from Rome's fountains and standing under giant fans set up outside the Coliseum. Some were forced to queue for taxis for more than an hour in the scorching heat outside the central railway station in Rome due to the capital's chronic shortage of cabs. The Spanish city of Seville roasted amid the heat wave of the summer. Locals and tourists braved the scorching heat by drinking water and trying to escape from the sun. One local tourist guide said some foreigners normally ditch the tours as they cannot stand the high temperatures of the season. In Greece, authorities have been trying to contain a wildfire moving through forests north of Athens for a second day after intensifying overnight. Residents of nearby villages have been requested to leave their houses as flames approach. Emergency workers doused flames from planes flying over Penari in the Devonokoria area north of Athens as the fires intensified overnight. Meteorologists have warned of a high risk of fire this week. Also battling wildfires today is Switzerland, which battled a forest fire that forced more than 200 people to evacuate as authorities warned the blaze could spread further if winds pick up and could take days or weeks to fully extinguish. A fire broke out on Monday in the forested flank of a mountain in Bich in the Valais Canton near the Italian border, forcing authorities to deploy an army helicopter to support firefighting efforts. Temperatures have been high in China, leaving authorities to take measures that would help citizens cope with the heat wave. Railway stations across southwestern municipality of Chongqing have set up 127 cooling shelters to combat the intense summer heat. Most of the cooling shelters are equipped with air conditioning, free water, and even medicine to combat heat stroke. Meanwhile, rescue operations have been going on at inundated alleyways in the southern Fujian province after a major typhoon struck and caused widespread flooding across the region. Footage from Fuzhou Fire Department showed residents being ferried across the city's flooded roads where outer reaches of Typhoon Talim had caused heavy rainfall. The Middle East has also experienced the impacts of the heat wave, with temperatures and humidity on the rise in the United Arab Emirates. Dubai municipality opened three beaches for night swimming to help residents escape the summer heat. Assistant lifeguards monitor beachgoers during their nighttime dip. Bright lighting systems and electronic screens displaying safety awareness were installed across the 800-meter night swimming beaches in Jumeirah 2, Jumeirah 3 and Om Sukem 1. 
Finally, a heat wave in the Gaza Strip that has sent temperatures over 38 degrees Celsius worsened power shortages and sparked discontent among residents who expressed frustration with the ruling Islamist Hamas group. More than 2.3 million people live in a narrow strip of land squeezed between Egypt and Israel, suffering power cuts for up to 12 hours a day. The area needs around 500 megawatts of power a day in the summer. The World Meteorological Organization says the heat wave engulfing the northern hemisphere is set to intensify this week, causing overnight temperatures to surge and leading to an increased risk of heart attacks and deaths. The WMO warns that the heat wave is in its early phase, saying that it is expects the temperatures in North America, Asia, North Africa and the Mediterranean to be above 40 degrees Celsius for a prolonged number of days this week as the heat wave intensifies. And this could now mean the midnight temperatures hovering in the high of 30 degrees in some areas this week. Impacts on people, economies, the natural and built environment are very serious. A recent study has calculated that in Europe last summer, 60,000 additional people died uh, due to extreme heat, um, and that uh, number is considered to be quite conservative by uh, the experts who did the work as well as government. Um, so, and it's worth noting that that number is for Europe, and of course we're seeing extreme heat waves uh, widespread around the world, and uh, Europe has some of the strongest early warning systems and heat health action plans in the world, so you can imagine what the numbers are likely to be globally. So we are seeing continuing growth in the frequency, duration and intensity of heat waves. And this is entirely consistent with the science of global warming and IPCC reports. These events will continue to grow in intensity and the world needs to prepare for more intense heat waves. Uh, the recently declared El Nino is only expected to amplify the occurrence and intensity of extreme heat events. So um, we're in for a bit of a ride, I'm afraid. And they will have quite serious impacts on human health and livelihoods. Heat waves are really an invisible killer. We are experiencing hotter and hotter temperatures for longer stretches of time every single summer here in Europe. And as we heard, it's not a European phenomenon. It's, it's everywhere around the globe. Um, in the past 10 years, more than 400,000 people have died from extreme climate and weather-related disasters, according to the World Disasters Report that my organization, the IFRC, is publishing. And every one of these deaths is a tragedy to the families and loved ones that they leave behind. As we heard from colleagues, um, infants, the elderly, People with chronic health conditions are at a particular risk. Well, former U.S. President Donald Trump says that while in another development, Chinese Premier Li Qiang said in a meeting with U.S. climate envoy John Kerry on Tuesday, July 18th, that cooperation was needed to tackle global warming as waves of extreme heat and rainfall hit large parts of the world. At the same meeting in Beijing, Kerry told Mr. Li that as the two largest emitters of greenhouse gases, it was vital for both countries to show the world how they could cooperate and begin to address this with the urgency it requires. Kerry's third visit to China as U.S. climate envoy marks the formal resumption of top climate level climate uh, diplomacy between both countries that have been marred by disputes over Taiwan and trade. The former Secretary of State is the third top U.S. official to visit Beijing in the past month. President Biden is really hopeful that we can advance the climate agenda. And China and the United States are the two most powerful economies in the world. We also happen to be the two largest emitters of greenhouse gases. And so the imperative of our two countries coming together and working and showing the rest of the world how we can cooperate and begin to address this with the urgency it requires is incredible. Away from the weather now, former U.S. President Donald Trump says he expects to be arrested by a federal investigation into the January 6 riots at the Capitol and efforts to challenge the results 
of the 2020 election. In a social media post, Mr. Trump said that he was informed by special counsel Jack Smith on Sunday night that he was a target of their inquiry. Mr. Trump posted that he was told to report to a grand jury, which almost always means an arrest and indictment. The special counsel did not immediately respond to media inquiries such as indictment will be Mr. Trump's third for alleged criminal offences, including 37 charges brought by Mr. Smith's team in June accusing the president, former president of mishandling classified documents. A U.S. national is likely to be in North Korean custody after crossing the inter-Korean border during a tour without approval. That's according to the U.N. command. The person was taking part in a tour to the joint security area, the border village in, in the demilitarized zone separating the two Koreas where soldiers from both sides stand guard. The UN command said on Twitter, a US national on a GSA orientation tour crossed without authorization and the military demarcation line into the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. Adding, in their words, we believe he is currently in DPRK custody and are working with our KPA counterparts to resolve this incident, referring to North Korea's People's Army. Our Washington correspondent, Maria Verrett, joins us now. Hello, Maria. Thank you for joining us on The World today. Thank you for having me. And first off, how are Americans reacting to what the former president has said about the January 6th riot in the Capitol? Is this an admission of guilt? You know, it's a very interesting question, admission of guilt. I think the president would say that he's not. Um, admitting to any kind of guilt when it comes to January 6th. I think he's been very clear to say he believes the letter is targeted. He believes that these allegations are targeted toward him, and he's expecting an indictment. Um, that is what we have seen over the past few months as it relates to the former president's uh, of special investigations that have occurred. So I think that at this time, he's really looking to see whether or not and, and bringing forth um, his own side of the story so that if he is indicted or when he is indicted, that there's no surprise to the American people. Uh, let's talk about the situation in North Korea. What do we know about uh, this U.S. citizen that has possibly been held by the government? Well, uh, North Korea, what we do know at this time is that this uh, is a U.S. soldier uh, that was in a village of a security area uh, between North and South Korea. Um, and it looks as if what they're um, stating is that he actually crossed into North Korean territory uh, while he was visiting uh, this village area. So that is, I think, the question now that the American uh, government is trying to work through with North Korea is what he was actually doing, what his intentions were, and if they can secure his release. But at this time, that is what they believe has occurred in the process that actually happened. And how is the U.S. government reacting to this? Is the government saying anything about it? Well, uh, the government is at uh, this time being very quiet as to exactly how this happened, uh, why uh, he could have been detained, other than the general information that is known that he is a, uh, a U.S. serviceman um, and that also he was right there at the border um, at the DMZ and that he, I think there was no intentions uh, for him to cross over into North Korea, um, an area that was not uh, secure, an area that was not authorized. For US, um, and he was in plain clothes. So that is the other piece is that he was not in his serviceman attire. He was in uh, plain clothes, so he was not a mess even recognized as a serviceman while at the DMZ area. But given that the United States and North Korea relations have not been closed, what is likely to be the cause of action for both sides? It's likely to be the course of action um, at this time is that we will see those who have been in communication with North Korea previously. Um, as we know, there were some headway during previous administrations with the U.S. and North Korea. Um, and so they're going to try to provide uh, some sort of a, uh, a agreement between the two and try to come to some sort of uh, clarity around what the intentions were and hoping that that in and of itself will allow for some release. If there, if this becomes political and this ends up a political detainment, I think we are talking about a very different circumstance uh, that I think the U.S. might not be clear on how they will handle it, to your point of the fact that the U.S. and North Korea have not had the most friendliest relationship in recent years.
All right. Thank you very much, Maria Berta, Washington correspondent, for your contribution on this topic on the world today. Let's just move to other stories now. For the first time since the 1980s, a U.S. nuclear-armed ballistic missile submarine visited South Korea on Tuesday, July the 18th. A White House official confirmed that the Allies launched talks to coordinate their responses in the event of a nuclear war with North Korea. White House Indo-Pacific coordinator Kurt Campbell confirmed the rare visit during a briefing in Seoul, where he was attending the first nuclear consultative group discussion with South Korean officials. The submarine's visit had been expected after it announced in a joint declaration during a summit between South Korean President Yoon Sung Yeol and U.S. President Joe Biden in Washington in the month of April. The NCG aimed at better coordinating an allied nuclear response in the event of a war with North Korea was also announced during the April summit amid growing calls in South Korea for its own nuclear weapons, a step Washington has opposed. South Korea's defense ministry later confirmed the submarine's arrival and identified it as the USS Kentucky and Ohio-class SSBN. U.S. SSBNs rely on still to ensure their survival and then preserve their ability to launch nuclear missiles during a war, and they rarely make public stops in foreign ports. And we do believe it is important to manifest uh, these commitments uh, as we speak, uh, uh, an American nuclear submarine uh, is making port in Busan today. It's the first visit of an nu American nuclear submarine in decades. And let's check in on Thailand now, where Prime Ministerial Hopeful says that he is willing to manage the pace of his Move Forward Party's ambitious reform drive if he becomes leader. But he has vowed no retreat from a plan to change a law that forbids insulting the monarchy. Peter Lim Jarniart, also who led this party to election victory in May, described efforts by the military establishment to block him as a broken record, saying that Thailand had entered a new era with a public hankering for change. The move forward agenda is controversial, with its boldest aim being to amend Article 112 of the Criminal Code, under which people can face up to 15 years in jail for insulting the monarchy, a matter Peter said it would not back down from, but is willing to find a common ground on Parliament. When people ask me, how do you feel that you have failed? And I would respond back to them that I won, I formed, and I got blocked. I didn't fail. I won the election, I formed the coalition, and I got blocked by the appointed Senate. Let us be clear on that. So if you think about it in this perspective, I'm honored to be nominated, and I'm grateful for how far we have come together uh, to this point. And, and, and you know, it's not, a, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon, and, and I have the stamina to to run for a long, long time. It's something that makes people mad, you know? It's a dis disequilibrium between 40 million people who shows one system. It's not just about 29 even. It's about 40 million people who shows one system that was agreed upon, which is called election, mm -hmm. and 250 appointed senators without any uh, linkages to the people. So it's 40 million versus 250. 40 million against 250. I mean, the viewers can do the math. If you do 40 million divided by 250, that's the kind of disproportion of getting into power that is so skewed um, in this country. And so the people have the right to be angered. There's a zone of possibility. You know, there's a zone of possible agreements. There's poli policy instruments of how you achieve the result. So when you hear that coming out from the most polarized figure in the parliament. Parliament has hope to come out of this conflict because what you have said is something that we had a discussion or a dialogue within our party themselves. So, you know, I'm still sticking to what I had promised the voters, you know, to take, uh, to, to make sure that, you know, in every uh, institutions in Thailand, if it's a constitutional monarchy, 
the monarchy, the monarchy can do no wrong there. Uh, he, the, the institution is about politics, and I'm not going to allow it to be used to destroy political opponents. So if, if we work about it in various ways, I'm willing to be flexible in that sense. You know, it doesn't have to be exactly what I proposed. And that's really the, the primary intention, because once you submit it into the parliament, you got to debate it. you got to have the committee, the first round, the second round, the third round before it comes, uh, before it becomes law. Um, so nobody can monopolize anything. Israeli protesters have taken to the streets of Tel Aviv and other cities during a day of disruption as legislators prepare to ratify one of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's disputed judicial bills before Parliament goes on summer recess. Thousands poured into the streets in rallies across the country, many waving Israeli flags, and police reported at least a half dozen highways had been blocked. Despite soaring temperatures, hundreds gathered in front of the Tel Aviv's rabbinical court and the building of the Hitzstradrut Labour Federation, waving flags and chanting slogans. Several protesters who blocked the streets confronted an, um, an angry driver, others coupled with security. And that reform cast by opponents as curbing court independence and by Mr. Netanyahu as balancing branches of government has set up a half a year long constitutional crisis and contributed to U.S. concern about his hard right coalition. Australia's state of Victoria will not host the 2026 Commonwealth Games due to projected cast overrun, placing the future of the quadrennial multi-sport gathering in doubt. Victoria State Premier Daniel Andrews said on Tuesday, July the 18th, that the cost of the game, which were to have been held in four regional hubs, could blow out more than $7 billion uh, from a budgeted $2.6 billion if it went ahead. Mr. Andrews said that Victoria had already informed the global governing body Commonwealth Games Federation, that's a G CGF, in an amicable meeting, but the cost of breaking the 2026 contract was yet to be decided. No other country outside Australia bid for the 2026 Games. Look, I've made a lot of difficult calls, a lot of very difficult decisions in this job. This is not one of them. Uh, frankly, six to seven billion dollars for a 12-day sporting event, we are not doing that. That does not represent value for money. That is all cost and no benefit. What's become clear uh, is that the cost of hosting these games in 2026 is not the $2.6 billion, which was budgeted and allocated and is sitting, uh, vast, vast majority of which has not been spent. Uh, it's not $2.6 billion. It is, in fact, at least $6 billion uh, and could be as high as $7 billion. And I cannot stand here and say to you that I have any confidence that that even $7 billion number would appropriately and adequately fund these games. In terms of uh, where we go to from here, the uh, games will not proceed uh, in Victoria in 2026. Uh, we have informed Commonwealth Games authorities of our decision um, to seek to terminate the contract. Uh, and to not conduct, not, not host the games. Uh, but we've looked at Melbourne, we've looked at less sports, we've looked at less hubs, we've looked at every conceivable option. All of them are far in excess of the $2.6 billion that's been budgeted. So all of them represent more cost than there is benefit. Welcome back. Equity, the trade union for the performing arts and entertainment industries in the United Kingdom, say they're planning their own protests across the country in support of the actor's strike in America. SAG-AFTRA, which is Hollywood's largest union, representing 160,000 film and television actors, said on Tuesday Thursday that its board had unanimously agreed to a strike after failing to reach a deal with studios including Walt Disney Co. and Netflix Incorporated. While actors and equity contracts can still work, the union is in full support of the strike and keen to make sure that no loopholes are attempted.
Uh, let's speak with VOA's Jania Delort in Los Angeles in the U.S. Hello, Jania. Thank you very much for joining us on The World today. Well, the strike action uh, began last week. Why exactly are actors joining this action? I think that is primarily being driven by script writers and other workers in the entertainment industry and not them. Uh, as you know, uh, writers have been on strike since May. Writers Guild of America, then they've been going around studios and picketing. As you can see right now behind me, I am in front of the Walt Disney Studios and uh, strikers gathered here at 9 a.m. So writers has been on strike since May. But last week, last uh, night of Thursday, the contract that SAG-AFTRA, it's a American Union Guild representing actors, uh, as you mentioned, 160,000 um, actors worldwide. The contract expired with studios. And uh, after negotiating and figuring out that they cannot reach the conclusion on terms, they decided to go on strike. But what do they want exactly? What are they demanding? There are three main demands. First is a uh, increase of pay. Actors who live in Los Angeles and act in network movies, they don't feel that they can afford the uh, cost of living in Los Angeles. So they say that what they're being paid is not enough. Second, it, it is they ask for increase in residuals and rethinking the po uh, policy in residuals. And this is a payment that actors being paid after each time after the show airs. As, as we know, with the rise of streaming services, the, the shows are aired, re-aired, so, uh, sold, resold all the time, and actors don't feel that they get enough residuals for that. And third, they ask, ask yes. Yeah, go ahead. And third, go ahead. they ask the protection from uh, artificial intelligence. They uh, Recently, there's new demand and contracts that actors have to sign, that they have to be scanned, and their likeness can be used in future projects without even their consent or without even being paid. And actors believe that uh, it's, it's an existential crisis for them and for their profession. But the strike does not appear to be gaining traction now moving across the pond. It does resonate because, I mean, there's an entertainment industry on the other side. Well, it's hard for me to say because I'm here in Los Angeles in the United States, but what I understand, you know, everyone knows Hollywood actors. Everyone likes Hollywood actors. And plus, it's a huge movement, 160,000 people. And people across the world, uh, they worry that they next come the Christmas season, they're not going to see their favorite new Christmas movie with their favorite actors. And that very well might happen. So I think that's why the strike is so resonating across the globe. All right. Thank you very much. We'll keep our eyes on that story. Thank you so much, VOA's Jania Delors in Los Angeles, talking about the actors' uh, strike. Thank you. Former Nissan and Renault chairman Carlos Jones has uh, slammed the current direction of the Carmakers Alliance, saying that they were trying to go for reduced cooperation amid distrust between the organizations. Both companies are holding discussions about a final agreement to overhaul the alliance after announcing in January that the deal will see Renault bring down its stake in Nissan to 15% from about 43% to put them on an equal level. It also spoke to reporters in Tokyo via video stream. He said that no regrets about feeling Japan because he had zero chance of receiving a fair trial. With the latest agreement, it's trying to go for a mini alliance with a very reduced scope of cooperation. Still a lot of distrust between the two organizations. That's exactly the situation. When I discovered through the procedures and the pre-trial that I have zero chance of having a fair trial, that the conclusion was already written on the wall. I have only one way out. Uh, I uh, find solution for problems, even the most difficult one. And this was the best solution uh, for me, and I don't regret it. The centuries-old tradition of swan upping the census of the royal swan population on stretches of the river Thames got underway on Monday. Led by David Barber, the swan maker to Britain's okay. King Charles, swan upping involves a recording details of swans and then their 
programs and then releasing them back into the water. Barber, who wears a scarlet coat and a swan feather in his hat, has been carrying out the census for decades. But this was his first under a new monarch. Succeeding his mother, Queen Elizabeth, Charles inherited the country's and marked swans in a shared ownership with old trade associations, vintners and dyers, who also join in the army. As they gathered at the lock, the swan others also raised a toast to the king and also performed a traditional or salute to, Charles, to King Charles at the end of the first day of the exercise. Hengang's friends told he was a uh, cool tell that he was enjoying his birthday party in a pricey health conscious restaurant in downtown Shanghai. By the way, he licked his food off the plate. The one year old four baby ordered a collie sighting in a boogie and wearing a cupcake hat. Heng Cheng was the only one at that table enjoying the carefully prepared, elaborately plated food, which at the Cats and Dot Club is for pets only. China's pets economy was worth 493.6 billion yuan, and that's about $69 billion last year, a 25% increase on the previous year, and that's according to data coming from research firm in media research. It is expected to reach 811.4 billion yuan by the year 2025. Part of this growth is attributed to smaller family sizes in China. The country recorded its lowest birth rate on record last year. A growing number of people are also living alone, with state media publishing data last year showing that China has 125 million one-person households, increasing the importance of having an animal as a companion. The Cat and Duck Club, which opened in 2021 to cater to a growing army of pet lovers, serves an extensive menu to its animal customers, with an average meal costing around 90 yuan, and that's about $12.52. Well, for those of us who have pets, we know how much this means to them. But on that beautiful note, we end the world today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Mwawadu. Thank <laughs> you.